Welcome to the Studio Talk podcast. I'm Xiomara Sosa, your co-host. Every week, we speak to our community members to teach them about mental health through education and awareness, and our hope is to inspire them through social change advocacy. We also interview community members and other mental health professionals, clinicians, healers, students, and wellness professionals. Our style is storytelling. Everyone has a mental health story to tell. The information shared in this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health professional and is not a substitute for psychological diagnosis or treatment. It's purely educational and purely social change advocacy. If you find yourself in any sort of mental health emergency or distress, please dial 911 or go to your nearest emergency room. Welcome everyone. Welcome back to Studio Talk. We are here, Victoria and myself are here um, with today's topic. And the topic of the day is depression, clinical depression, Mm -hmm. actually. So welcome. Um, We're going to try something new today where we're going to try to start our two-part episodes so that we don't have hours long episodes anymore. So bear with us as we try this. So um, we'll probably have a part one and a part two to this topic. Um, And again, it's just going to be a conversation. We have some notes that we're going to refer to, but we're just going to see where the conversation takes us because depression is such, I don't know, a misunderstood, you know, illness because it really is an illness, but because people use the term often in real life every day it gets confused as a non-clinical situation and so we're going to talk a little bit about all of that to kind of try to explain the differences between regular depression and what we as clinicians deal with when it has to do with clinical depression and although there's a lot of similarities there are very very specific differences as to why it gets diagnosed as a disorder right Victoria? Right. I couldn't have said it better myself. (laughs) Um, I do think that, I think we talked about this before, but anxiety and depression are the two mental illnesses that are becoming, you know, less stigmatized. It gets Mm -hmm. talked about a lot more, Mm -hmm. but I think because it gets talked about a lot more, people are starting to misdiagnose themselves yeah. with anxiety and depression. So I think a big point I want to harp on today is what's the difference between depression and sadness, depression and grief? Yeah. Um, do I have a mental illness or am I just having a tough time during life? Right. You know, so we're going to go through all the clinical differences between yeah. those. Yeah. And, you know, and we should probably say that with the DSM-5, which is the newer version that we have, they've they, had, they didn't reclassify, they just kind of reorganized and renamed something. So we mm-hmm. may use those terms interchangeably, and then some of the c- criteria is a little bit different, and so we'll talk about that a little bit. But what we don't want to do is complicate it too much with all the clinical terms. What we're really trying to do is get a general understanding out there so that people aren't afraid to go see your doctor and ask. Because, by the way, doctors know how to screen you for this. Mm -hmm. Regular old doctors know how to screen you and they should be screening you for this because that's supposed to be how we get a lot of our referrals, which by the way, it is how I get a lot of my referrals. Um, you know, when, when OBGYNs, GYNs and, um, uh, frontline doctors have screened their, their clients and they have, you know, shown that they are in, in clinical depression and then they'll call me and ask me if I'll take their referral. And, Mm -hmm. And that's very different than when someone goes in to see their doctor and they're going through a hard time and they're depressed because of a recent loss or whatever and and they're just going through a normal depression. Not the same. I would say I think doctors and like primary care physicians do a better job at accurately diagnosing depression than other disorders like bipolar, oh, OCD, yeah. you know yeah. what I mean? So Yeah, the two that um, I trust the most with them is anxiety and... And depression. And depression. They're yeah. really good. They, I, I think that, you know, they and, and the tools that they use, the tools that we all use just to get the, the general screening out, it makes sense. And what I like about the primary care doctors and the GYN doctors doing it is that they know their clients and they know their history and they know their medical issues and they know like what they need to know to get a good understanding of is this something that they're going through because I, you know their child is sick and therefore you know they're exhibiting these symptoms or is this something that just came on mm-hmm. you know and we don't know if it's if it's 
technically, you know, a clinical issue or, if yeah. it, you know, so there, I, I think that I like that, that they have the history in it with them. Yeah. In that and, ta- sense. and talk to your doctor if you are feeling like you're experiencing depression, especially if you trust them. I think mm-hmm. a lot of people don't know that. They don't know that their PCP or their, their primary care physician can actually assess them for yeah. um, something with a mental illness. Um, right, right, right. So you don't have to go to a psychiatrist and pay exactly. $500 just <laughs> yeah. to get a depression diagnosis. Yeah. You can get it while you're at the doctor. Yeah. So, you know, and we, and that's what we do. I mean, if you come into directly to us, we, us as mental health clinicians, that's what we're trained to do. But there's, it's great when you have sort of like the teamwork going on mm-hmm. with primary care physicians. I love that idea. And I mean, I, I'm glad that it's done more and more now. Okay, so let's talk about depression. Um, Where do you want to start? Okay, who do I start? So let's just talk about regular depression, right? That has nothing to do with mental health issues, mental illness, nothing. Okay? People get depressed. Mm -hmm. People get angry. People get have anxiety, you know, when they have a big test that's coming, when they're going to the doctor, that does not mean that you have a mental illness. That does not mean that you have anxiety disorder. That does not mean anything like that. It just means that you're going through this short period, you know, and you have to deal with this depression, which includes sadness and the human condition. Yeah, the human condition and all of that. And so don't, every time you get these emotions, don't think, oh my God, I wonder if I need to have my doctor check me out. No, that's not what we're talking about because mm-hmm. it has to become disruptive, chronic, and a whole lot of other symptoms need to be present and a whole lot of other things need to be assessed before it really is considered a clinic, you know, has crossed into the clinical area of it so regular depression is regular depression when we're teenagers we we sort of go through that a lot those (laughs) angsty years yeah we feel a lot of that um when we're going through troubles in our lives if we're unhappy at work if we're scared that someone we love is you know diagnosed with something or whatever kind of life-related issues that come up and or, you know, the state of the world, COVID, you know, whatever, you name it, mm-hmm. money, recession, it, it can trigger a lot of these feelings. So that's normal. It's normal. And, and Victoria and I have always been pretty adamant about the fact that all of these, these emotions and these feelings that most people don't want to feel are necessary. Like, you have to yeah. feel this in life. This is part of being, this is part of how you manage life mm-hmm. is you take the good with the bad, you, you, you sit with the not so good stuff and not try to drink it away, sex it away, dance it away, spend it away. You, you literally have to go through that process to get to the other side and then it goes away or it lifts, yeah. you know, and, and that's sort of the way humans are meant to deal with emotions. Um, when it becomes, or when you notice that this is not something that is a direct result of something going on in your life or that something that went on in your life or that there doesn't seem to be a specific reason why. It's just a general feeling. You don't know how to describe this feeling. And it never feels just like depression. And, which is why I think they need to change that word, depression. Because just like I think they need to change antidepressant medication and call it something else. Mm-hmm. Because it doesn't do anti... You know what I'm saying? It's, it just gives the impression that it's a happy pill. It's yeah. make you happy. And that's not really what it does. So when you start to feel... When it's clinical depression. And we'll talk about all the different reasons why this could happen to people, why they have clinical depression, because it's different for different people. But the thing for me that I go by is if it's lasting for way over two weeks for anybody, and it's not just a general sadness that you're feeling, but then there's anandonia is a big one. That's the one I get a lot. And anandonia is just a fancy word of saying, I feel nothing. I feel nothing. Or I feel no pleasure ever with anything, mm-hmm. as opposed to I'm miserable and you know and depressed here. But then my sister comes, or my brother comes, or my best friend comes over to kind of spend some time with me, and it helps me feel better and get me through like the night. And then I have an okay night. And Andonia, you don't get that. Yeah. Just nothing, nothing changes that. Also, you have a lot of physical feelings. For me, you know, I always feel it, and my, my body feels like. When there's an episode coming on, I always feel some kind of heaviness. Like the weight of my body feels different. I lose the ability to taste things the way that I normally do. I don't hear, I can't hear music. It's like when music comes on, it's because this is all about my brain. You know, for me, it's all, you know, it's all neurolog, you know, it's all neurolog. 
neuroscience. <laughs> Um, it's all in my brain. The majority of it is in my brain and then everything else sort of triggers it. So when my brain is not operating at its best, when my serotonin levels are low, when my dopamine isn't, when all of those kinds of things aren't working and I'm triggered into an episode and it happens naturally for me, it's not necessarily that I have it because I'm going through something. It's just a natural illness like diabetes when your blood pressure goes up or whatever. Yeah. So with me, it, it has to do with that. There are things that I need to do to make sure that it doesn't get triggered more <laughs> like you know like but in general um i can just be having a perfect perfect life everything's going okay and then one morning i'll wake up and i know i know it i feel it i wake up and i can feel it in the heaviness of my body my mm -hmm. eyes are a dead giveaway the way that they feel because i can't really open them but i know they're open but they feel like they're not open i don't really see very close so i start feeling like different physical um symptoms i really get fatigued fatigue is a huge symptom you know mm -hmm. and most people do have that as a symptom um appetite is another one sleep is another one you don't have the energy to bathe is another one to brush your teeth you'd rather be like all kinds of things that go on for me i always allow myself the two-week marker which is what i generally do with my clients too it's like for two weeks we're going to do the self-care we're going to do the this we're going to do everything but if it goes beyond that then i start to worry then it's like an, it becomes an episode you know, then it's an episode. It's not just, you know, it's up, it's gone, it's come and goodbye. It's it's here to stay and mm -hmm. it's going to be and we need to figure out what to do to, to do the intervention with that so that it doesn't become more problematic. Because the thing with depression is that it's insidious and it just grows and yes, grows. And I spreads. use that word all the time to mm -hmm. describe depression is mm -hmm. that it is insidious. And mm -hmm. if you're not really self-aware, you're not checking in with yourself, yeah. which is something I say probably every episode, check yeah. in with yourself. Um, yeah. You can just all of a sudden realize I'm in a deep depressive episode. And yeah. once you realize that you're deeply in it, it becomes harder to get out. Right, it's right. kind of like, you know, being in a hole. That's yeah. how I describe yeah. it. And there's so much denial because the people around you can't really understand what you're depressed about if something hasn't happened, <laughs> like to make you yes. depressed. Because, which is why I wish that they would change the word mm -hmm. <laughs> depression because, because it really started as a, you know, it was a cl clinical depression, all that stuff. And then people started throwing it around every time they got sad or, you know, some form of depression happened to them. They would call it depression. So now people kind of assume they're both the same and they're not, they're mm -hmm. really not the same. So, um, so really a mood disorder it makes more sense to me to call it a mood disorder because with the mood disorder, as opposed to I have depression, you know, really allows people to understand that the disorder is about your mood and the mood is based so much on the psychological things going on. It's based on your, your biology. It's based on your history. It's based on genetics. Sometimes mm -hmm. so much neuroscience involved. Nutrition plays a big role. Like all sorts of things play a big role and mood disorders require intervention. They require treatment. They require very specific ways to manage it. Which, um, which is different than sadness, yeah, right? Yeah, because typically sadness will just, alleviate on its own mm -hmm. it just takes some time something happened that's made me sad i'm gonna feel sad for a short yeah. or maybe a long amount of time yeah. but it eventually it'll get better just on yeah. its own yeah and sadness is doesn't hang out with a whole bunch of other things like depression does <laughs> like sadness comes and you know it's just kind of there and you're mopey but depression is it's almost like it's this black cloud and I know, like, to picture that, it's like, so what? It's a black hole. But it's, it's inside of your body. You can feel it inside of your body. You can feel it inside of your head. You can feel it. Your brain is fogged. So it's not even like you're thinking clearly. And you're trying to concentrate. Your concentration is off. The way that you hear what somebody's saying to you really gets interpreted completely different because this mood disorder has taken over and it is what it is. So, which is why the treatment for it is not just go home and eat ice cream and watch some <laughs> cute movies and you'll be fine in two days. No, that doesn't work for, for clinical depression. So, um, so, all right, so let's see. In the DSM, they break it down into several, I mean, there's the whole, the whole section on depressive disorders. Um, me, I, in, my, in my personal life, I have what they used to call dysthymia, um, which now in the DSM is called persistent depressive disorder. Um, I was unaware that I had this my entire life um, because I was one of those go get them, 
break out of it, overachieved, you know, kind of people. So mm-hmm. I, it never really got to a point where it interfered in my life, which is one of the, the key things to know about depression. When this interferes with your ability to live your life, that's, that's really a big sign. Yeah, you absolutely. really need, and it's not like, oh, I'm slowing down to kind of take care of myself. It's, I cannot function yeah. kind of thing. So when you know that it's gotten to that point, it's, you need to go talk to a professional so that they can help you figure out whether it's regular depression or clinical depression, because chances are it's clinical depression. So for me, I've had it all my life. I never re- realized that's what it was, because, you know, I used to write and be this big journaler and this big, like, write poems and stories. And so I always thought I was just like this deep thinking person mm-hmm. that <laughs> felt everything. It was so dramatic with between me and my cousins and my family and everything. And then I would go and do something, you know, I don't know, go join something and do some big thing. And then before you know it, the episode would kind of pass and I would be okay. But it was always in me, but never enough to, to hold my life up until I experienced 9-11. And then a few years after that was in a relationship with someone who had severe PTSD, severe severe depression and all kinds of stuff. And it was like feeding my depression. And I didn't Mm -hmm. realize that it was feeding my depression to watch this person go through what it was. So the nine 11, like the whole, everything that was left over from the nine 11 stuff. And then everything that was happening with this individual was sort of creating no place for my depression to be able to express itself and get better. Like I've normally done. So long story short, I went to see a counselor like, what the hell? Like this wave, I used to call it waves. This wave won't go away. It's like this wave comes in and, and I never was like this and what's going on? And, you know, they did, she did the whole assessment and everything. And she said, I want you to go see the psychiatrist. And, you know, she's a psychiatrist to me. And I was like, what? Mm-hmm. It's like, no, I, I just want you to go because I want them to screen you a little bit more. Based on everything that you've said to me, I want them to screen you a little bit more on... Um, clinical depression because I suspect that you've had this for a while and they're mm-hmm. going to do a particular screening and then this was like years ago because now we do it a little different um, and depending on what they say you're going to come back to me and we're going to continue our therapy and our counseling and everything but I really do want you to get screened and we'll talk about medication maybe or what we need to do depending on what they say and I went for the first time ever I mean and I said this guy he was a, usually psychiatrists love him and they do great jobs but they're very you know very clinical very like cold and warm they're not very touchy feel because they're doctors they're doctors so they're like medical people who want to like Mm -hmm. get things figured out and taken care and then all the touchy feely stuff kind of comes back to us we're the ones that deal with that so i went to this guy and he was not like that he was very cool and i sat down and i was talking 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 and and he took like my life story and you know everything that we always say an assessment should be all about and he said and at the end of that he said you know something Based on everything that we've discussed and you've told me and everything, it sounds to me like you've had dysthymia your whole life, but you've always come out of it because you've always done self-care. You've always been that person to know enough Mm -hmm. to do self-care. Like, and he even mentioned stuff like you joined the military and you went to the air force and you did this and you did that in the army and you did these things that sort of helped you propel yourself, you know, to where you needed to go. So you define, but now none of those things are working anymore. And they're not working anymore um, for a reason. We just need to figure out why, no matter what you do, it's not working anymore. But it doesn't sound like this is new. Mm -hmm. What it sounds like is that it's more prominent and more permanent, and we need to figure out why and how to help you do it. And for me, what inevitably had happened is that my brain went offline. Between 9-11 and then the situation with, from that, and then the situation with the partner I was with, at the time, it just, it just all came, like it finally all came out. I had survivor's guilt. I had a whole lot of stuff. So yeah. there was no room for dysthymia to sort of like do its thing that it normally, it just all became clinical depression. Like it just was clinical depression. I needed to get treated for it. I needed to put my, my brain back online. Like my brain was not online. I, mm-hmm. you know, there was trauma, there was all kind. there was grief, there was all kinds of stuff. But, and then there was also my natural biological depression that I have always had all my life. Um, so in my case, I, I did take meds for a little while and, you know, it helped me get back online. But what really helped was that helped with, for me anyway, it helped so much with the physical symptoms so that my counselor can do what my counselor needed to do so that the therapy could actually take hold. And then when I went back to her, I recognized that that's what she meant when she sent me to him. Like, mm-hmm. I don't want to sit here with you and it take longer than it needs to take when really you have a big biological component to this that he mm-hmm. can help you with, mm-hmm. and then I can help you with the talk. The two of them together is what's going to help you. Yeah, and sometimes you do hit that wall 
in therapy where we can only take you so far, you know, to where like, I think this is chemical, this is, you know, biological, whatever you want to call it. Like, it's okay to add medication to therapy, you know, Mm -hmm. because sometimes you need more than just therapy. Yeah. And the thing to know about medication is like before, this is why I have an issue with it being called antidepressant, because it sort of gives the impression that it's a happy pill. Mm -hmm. And therefore you take it and you feel happy. That's not what it does. First of all, it won't work for you if you don't have some form of actual clinical depression. It's just not because it has nothing to fit. Like it has no neuroscience to work with, you know, like, so it can't do anything. So, excuse me. (laughs) And so, so there's that. But I think the bigger picture is that when your physical symptoms, which include your brain being all fucked up, it's, it just does. That's really, I'm going to put it out there. Your brain's all fucked up. So no, you cannot function correctly. Mm -hmm. And depression, clinical depression is expressing itself because that's what is based, you know, that's sort of where the root of it is kind of at, you know, and, and you're doing the best that you can with a little bit that is operating under, you know? Mm-hmm. So what medication does is it sort of puts you back online. It gets, it gets the neuroscience working the way it needs to work. It gets your central nervous system back to where it needs to be so that your sleep is not disrupted, so that your mood is not all over the place, so that your cognitive abilities are not distorted because that is a huge thing with clinical depression is you are you, you, cognitive distortions are just and I don't mean you're crazy and you're saying things blah, blah, blah. it means that the way that you perceive something is so exaggerated or it's so different or it's so not really the way it kind of it's, it's just not it, it's it's not the way that you would be looking at it if depression wasn't influencing how you're looking at it it's a lot of times it's your depression talking it's your depression Mm -hmm. you know making you act that way and you think it's you you know so anyway so with me that's how it worked for me and then once my counselor was able once I was able to kind of get back online and get physically in line with what I needed to do she did what she needed to do with the talk therapy and the CBT and all that stuff and then eventually I went into remission and ever since then when I feel an episode coming on and I know that that's what it is, I do what I need to do to sort of prevent it from going into an episode. But when I go into an episode that's beyond something that I know I need to, that I can kind of let go, I do do my medication because it's kind of like having diabetes and not wanting to take your diabetic medication Mm -hmm. and thinking that you're just going to eat right and have your lifestyle, you know, different and whatever. And then you don't need your, it's the same freaking thing. Okay. Your body still needs what it needs in order to help the rest of you go into remission. Yes. And it's, I mean, I feel like a lot of people struggle with the idea of taking medication. They don't want to be dependent on something or they think it's addictive. Yeah. Or if they're going to take it, they know that eventually they'll get their lives together or whatever that means. Yeah. Um, Then I'll be able to not take this medication anymore. And I just had this conversation with another therapist, actually, Mm. um, because it's so funny that we constantly are trying to destigmatize, mm-hmm. take the shame away from our clients who are experiencing that with medication. But we do the same thing, mm. you know? Okay, I'm a therapist. Like, I should not have to take medication. I can just use these techniques on myself. Wow. Um, and so then we, we do that. Uh, we stop taking the medication. Wow. And then very quickly we realize, oh my God, yeah, this was really helping me. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Because it's a part... If, if you have clinical depression... And if for you medication, because it doesn't work for everybody, Medi- medication no. is very tricky, very, very tricky what works and how it works. And it takes, so I lucked out where my guy got the right dose and the right kind and the right everything right the first time around and everything I was right. Yeah. Yeah, really lucked out with that. But that's not normally how it goes. People no. usually have to take this or take that and the amount people have to, you know, it's kind of like physical health. They have to figure out what of all the options that are out there is going to be work best with your biology, with your temperament, with your situation, with your level of depression, with everything. So maybe the first few times that they prescribe something is not going to be the one that's going to work for you. Mm-hmm. But you got to you really stick to it because the difference that it makes, it helps your body help you. And that's really the way people need to look at it. This thing is not for your brain. It's not necessarily for your, and when I say mind, I mean your you're kind of like you're, you're being, <laughs> it helps your biology brain, not 
your thinking brain, if that makes mm-hmm. sense. You know, like it helps the biology of your brain get right so that your thinking brain can sort of get back to where it needs to, to go. And, and, you know, it's, it's very complicated, but at the end of the day, I feel like people need to look at depression and anxiety sort of like when we were in grad school, how they used to say it's, it's what the common cold or the flu of, you know, of mental health. And most people yeah. will get it at some point. And for some people it will be, really bad and for some people it won't be it'll be just like a cold for other people it'll be like a flu for other people it'll be like covid Mm -hmm. you know we just don't know and so that's what the is going to depend what medication is going to you know do the right job and if medication is going to do the right job and do you have co something that else that you have you know going on too like anxiety so if you have anxiety and depression both kind of single you know within themselves or if you have a different disorder and you know, depression, then your medication is going to have to be a little bit different. And, you know, it's, so you have to work with a professional, like this whole self-diagnosing bullshit. Mm-mm, don't do that. Yeah. And it is really common with other mental illnesses. Like depression is very, very common with OCD, which is yeah. actually interesting because the symptomology of OCD and depression can be opposing. Right. For example, like a lot of people with depression, um, The first thing that uh, happens is they stop taking care of themselves or they stop with Mm -hmm. hygiene. Their room is very messy. But with OCD, we like order and cleanliness. So it's like, oh, my God, like my OCD is getting triggered by my depression. And it's just. Yeah, it turns into a thing. So. So. All right. So that's just kind of like the general idea. It's a little bit more complicated with this, which is why we always say don't listen to your friends. Get offline. Don't self-diagnose. Do not confuse Google with somebody's you know, master's degree in mental health or psychology, just don't do it. Don't let your cousin Anne tell you that they went through this and they did that and that worked and that's what you should do. And don't let, I get a lot of my clients because I get some clients that are, you know, from the Latino immigrant community. So there's like the whole cultural thing that I have to deal with with that. And I just had a few yesterday. And one of them is like, I finally came because my friend said she came and she had the same thing that I had going on. And now it's been four months and she feels so much better and she can recognize me going through this. But everybody in my life is telling me, don't, whatever you do, don't go see, don't go see a mental health person because they're going to give you medication. And if they, you know, it's like they scared Mm -hmm. the shit out of them about going to see anybody to get help. So then you want to see them suffer at home like this instead. Like, yeah. I, don't, I don't, you know, the thinking. But anyway, I, I get a lot of that. And so I have to do a lot of psychoeducation around that. And I have to also explain to them how the medication works. And like, would they be telling you the same thing if you were complaining about high blood pressure and you can't seem to do anything because your high blood pressure or your heart condition or anything else is giving you trouble? Would they be saying the same thing? And would you listen to them? Yeah. And they're like, no, <laughs> no, no, no. So um, anyway, difference? yeah, it's, it's, it's something. But anyway, what the hell was the point of that? Oh, okay. The point of that was the medication. Um, they were a little bit like funny about that. And so I had to explain to them how Medicaid, you have to, and I, I get it. You want to understand what the what the science in the medication is that it isn't just like here, take this pill and you'll be all fine. And it's Mm -hmm. not that, you know, it it takes a few weeks and it has to build up and you have to give your brain time to sort of adjust to the new levels of the serotonin or whatever it is that's going on with you. And certain kinds of antidepressants are different than other kinds of, for example, people who have bipolar disorder, um, which bipolar disorder, if people don't know, has one one side to it is severe depression but it's not listed in the dsm as one of the depressive disorders is it it has its own little category and there's a reason for that and the medication for it is different Mm -hmm. so giving them um antidepressants might actually be detrimental to them in a lot of cases so make sure that the person you're talking to understands you know um what they're doing. And that's why that's important because the depression that you feel when you have anxiety, the kind of depression that you feel when you have something like bipolar, which is very serious is not treated the same way. And that's for a very, very important reason. And the medication is different and the treatment is different. Okay. So just want to put that out there. Yes. Um, so anyway, so the whole persistent depressive disorder is one form of the depression. That's the dysthymia that I was talking about that I've dealt with in my life um so the other one and victoria if you want to talk about this a little bit is um major depressive disorder which is how do we explain that without sounding (laughs) therapy-ish i mean i always describe it as this is 
what we diagnose as as depression. This is the yeah. depression diagnosis, and sometimes it gets confusing because it's major depressive disorder. So a lot of people think like, well, I don't have major depressive. <laughs> and there's no minor depressive dis- disorder. No. It's like, we don't have that yeah, <laughs> as, exactly. as an option. This is the only <laughs> option. And then we have specifiers, mild, moderate, and severe. Yeah. So you can be diagnosed. So for example, I've been diagnosed with mild major depressive disorder. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's episodic. So yeah. it just comes in episodes. Um, but yeah, I would say it's just our term for a diagnosis of I think when we think of what depression is, this is the diagnosis that yeah. comes to my mind. Yeah. Um, yeah. When it has to do with depressive disorders, because when it has yes. to do with bipolar, that's a whole different thing. Yes. Yeah. So major depressive disorder is an actual diagnosis that you get. And then there are like, like Victoria said, specifiers involved in mild, moderate, severe. Um, then there's also, what is it? Um, one episode, and then there's I, it's like broken down into different episodes. If someone comes to me because they've had one episode, mm-hmm. and that's what I'm helping them with, and then they sort of go into remission and they do fine, you know, after that. Then there are other people who have repeated episodes, mm-hmm. and so it comes back and remember. So it's you know why it's important to make sure that you see someone who understands what clinical depression is, who really understands what major depressive disorder is when you get diagnosed with that and all the different variations of it, because you're not going to treat someone who has severe major depressive disorder the way that you're going to treat someone like me, for example, who comes in and I just, I have dysthymia, but it's not really symptomatic, (laughs) you know, like for six months, you're not going to talk to me and give me the same kind of treatment that you're going to give someone who is like, like right now I do have a client who, and it's my, my, a big learning curve for me. I have a client who has um, treatment resistant depression. Mm-hmm. Um, treatment resistant depression just means that this person was diagnosed with major depressive disorder a long time ago. And everything and anything that they've ever tried to help them with, and it's been severe, like very severe, very chronic, very, you know, suicide ideologies and like all kinds of stuff are involved. And nothing, medication, there, nothing, 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 nothing has ever worked. Nothing has ever worked. So they started treatment. What's it called? The ECT treatment? I think that's what it's called. Anyway, they've been going to the doctor to do all this stuff, but they also wanted to start doing talk therapy in a more consistent way because they recognize that their entire life when they've been dealing with this, they would go to a therapist and then stop going and then go and then stop going and then go. And which is very indicative of someone with depression. That's just sort of what happens. You just can't even get up out of bed, much less go, you know, to your, but anyway, this particular treatment that they got really helped kind of get them to where the medication is working a little bit better, but it's still treatment resistant, which is why they work very hard at making sure that they don't slide backwards. Mm -hmm. So, you have to work with a professional. They have to trust a professional. She comes every week. She does all kinds of homework. She does all kinds of stuff. And her days, you know, like for her having on a scale from one to 10, if she's at a four or three or a two, she's happy with that. You know, she's happy with it wow. being there because it's so much better than always being beyond the 10 all the yeah. time and beyond the 10 and not. Yeah. You know. So that to her is progress. Whereas someone else on a different level of clinical depression, if you're working with someone who understands how this works, they're not going to be okay with you being on a two, three or four. (laughs) They're going to want to see you, you know, at a 10 because you have the, the, you don't have treatment, um, resistant depression. So that's not, it's not, that's, that's probably not very, um, that goal for you should be a little different, you know? So that reminds me, there's a song by AJR, um, called way less sad. And I actually like love this song so much thinking about therapy because the main chorus says, no, I'm not happy yet, but I'm way less sad. And it's a very like yeah. upbeat, like yeah. happy song because he sees that as like the progress. Yeah. And that's the progress. That. It's like, great. And that's, that's, you know, it's very, it's very interesting. Um, and then, so the biggest kind, I, I guess the most prevalent depression that we deal with, well, I shouldn't speak for every counselor, but for me, that I deal with the most is major depressive disorder. That's what the majority of what people, and when we say that we're still, all of this still falls under clinical depression guys. Okay. So just, it's just not a clinical term in our DSM. So, Mm -hmm. you know, so the clinical term is major depressive disorder in our DSM. And that's what we deal with in all its variety in all its different ways. 
Um, so make sure that if you if you're feeling the symptoms, if you're feeling which we're going to go over some of the symptoms in a little bit, that you seek out a mental health counselor who really operates with a lot of knowledge in that area. That's not going to just sort of like sweep it under the rug with, oh, we'll just have you do some da 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 and put your medication and then you'll be. Don't do that. Go to someone who understands how simple and how complicated this can be and mm-hmm. they're going to do what works in your best interest, not what kind of like works for everybody. Why isn't this working for you? So don't, don't go with that person. <laughs> okay. Um, and then the persistent depressive disorder of, that we already talked about. And then the third one for me, because I have mostly women and women identified feminine, non-binary people that come to my practice, I get um, premenstrual dysphoric disorder clients. And I get referrals from doctors for that. And we're not going to talk too much about that. Just, I mean, I'm not going to talk too much about that just because that's very medical in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. And it's really like, I, we diagnose it. I, I know one time I was so appalled because I had a client and it was so obvious that they were dealing with this. But then the doctor that they were going to, she asked them about that. And they were like, I don't know what that is. Well, I don't know what your counselor is talking about. Like, it was horrifying to me that. Yeah, Somebody doesn't that know happens. what premenstrual dysphoric disorder is. Like, yeah, like that, that definitely was, happens. That's yeah. not that's not a disorder that really gets talked about yeah. a lot. Honestly, I don't remember. I don't remember the last time I've mentioned that disorder to anyone. Yeah. Um, but like you said, you work with women, and yeah. so that's probably going to happen more often in yeah. your practice. Yeah. It's 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 interesting, and that can be complicated. And I think that there's a lot of People don't know a whole lot about that. I mean, I learned about a lot about it, you know, and I'm still learning a lot about it. And it's just, you know, a lot of stigma and a lot of the usual around that. But that's definitely something that I see often enough, mm-hmm. you know, in every deal. So, but again, go go to someone that can help figure out the difference between which of these clinical depressions it is that you're having. Because you certainly don't want somebody to treat you for premenstrual dysphoric disorder if what you have is major depressive disorder you know what i mean yes you know they're definitely different yeah um so victoria let's talk about some of the symptoms okay yeah um so one symptom that i think is most indicative in my experience is negative self-talk and this this low self-worth um which can look like i think it can be very aggressive So, and what I mean by that is I like to use metaphors or analogies or whatever you want to call them. And I see depression as a bully and I see it as someone who is telling you, you don't deserve anything good in your life. You don't deserve relationships. You don't deserve to have a good job. You don't deserve to live. You don't deserve to be happy. I want to interrupt you because I think this is a great example for listeners that my depression doesn't have that. Really? My depression ne- has never had that. Like, that's never been a symptom. But that does not mean that I can't ever have it or that I the negative self-talk and the yeah. th- that sort of... I've never had to deal with that, which is why it was very hard for me to that's understand that diagnosis when it was... Pr- that was not a symptom. But I did have a whole lot of other symptoms that a lot of people don't have. But yeah. So, I wonder so- if that's... I wonder if that's common with major depressive disorder more so than dysthymia? I think so. I think that, you know, I I don't know. I I would assume so. But I also think part of it is why depression is going on with the individual in the first place. Mm. So your history, like I've, I don't, I don't know that this is part of it. But for me, for me personally, I was very lucky in my in my youth and my, you know, growing up and all that, where I never had necessarily had anything around me that would trigger that already mm-hmm. uh, thing of me talking. Because, you know, we all have those times in our lives when we're young and we're like, oh my God, I'm so not this and I'm ugly and my cousin's cuter and I'm not worth it. And, you know, like you have yeah. those insecurities. They never stuck with me long enough. But I was a very lucky child because parents and the grown ups around me were all very much not, you know, supportive and. Mm-hmm. You know, and if they noticed that, they would say something. And they were just very affirming and all that kind of stuff. I don't know that that's the norm. So I think that had I had not had that and I just had like regular vanilla people around me, I may have. That yeah, may have developed that more. That's so fascinating mm-hmm. to me because I have I've never experienced someone with a depressive disorder 
who has not experienced like just self. Yeah. I mean, self hatred. Really yeah. At no, some point. Never, 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 never. I, I have a lot. Of, I mean, my, a lot of my clients definitely do have yeah. that. But when I look into their history, like there's, there's, you know, in my clients in particular, there's a lot of child sexual trauma. There's a lot yeah. of emotional abuse. There's a lot of, you know, trauma. There's a lot of stuff that went on. I can't say I experienced that because I didn't. That is so, so interesting. I because I was going to ask, actually, um, you know, talking about like not practicing hygiene, you know, like not bathing, mm -hmm. not yeah. getting out of bed, not cleaning your room, just not taking care of yourself. That can be um, definite symptoms of mm -hmm. the beginning of a depressive yeah. episode. Losing interest in things that you're normally interested yeah. in. And I've always thought that that came from a place of think negative self-talk. No. But... I am fascinated no, to no. like ask you like where do you think that's coming from? Why is self sabotage or is that the right word? Yeah, use? yeah, self sabotage is a good one because I do do that when I'm in an episode. Yeah, like I know I have to do a thing that's going to have negative <laughs> repercussions if I don't do that thing, and it's going to be yeah. worse than if I and then I don't do it anyway, knowing that I'm sabotaging myself, and then it's worse. So where do you think that's rooted in? I think that's the cognitive distortion part of. I think that's the brain related issues mm -hmm. that has to with, cause I think not like, I think when my brain is healthy and my brain is functioning the way it's supposed to be functioning, it has a normal level of serotonin, dopamine, everything else is functioning well. And, and depression tries to come. I think that I have the ability to sort of be resilient in it mm -hmm. and kind of work towards it and work around it and let it be and like, I have that. But if my brain is offline, like what happened between nine 11 and you know, that situation, if it's not, and, it's, and I'm barely surviving, and I'm like on fumes, um, then it won't work. I'll go straight into a depressive episode because yeah. I don't have enough. I don't have enough of whatever that is, like that psychiatrist explained to me, that keeps it from from going there. Yeah. yeah. So, so I know that we talked about that <laughs> we're going to try to do part one, part two, and part three of these discussions. And this is our first attempt at doing it. Yes. Um, we are going to be signing off. Um, because we want to give J-Rock the opportunity <laughs> to kind of help us figure out how to do this part one of this discussion and then add part two as the next episode. So this is where we're going to wrap it up and we're going to leave you on that cliffhanger. Why do some people have that whole self-hatred, loathing, yeah, negative... Yeah, me thinking. Yeah. Like, I'm like reassessing yeah. everything uh -huh. now. <laughs> and others don't have that. Not everybody yeah. has that. And why is that? Is it biological? Is it... You know, family systems. Is it? Is yeah. it? You know, nutrition. What? What is it? I think so. it makes a lot of sense what you said about experiences. Mm -hmm. and yeah, I do. Yeah. All right, guys. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna say goodbye. There's now we're so gonna much say... more to talk about. So <laughs> yeah. So we're gonna wrap up part one of our beginning discussions on clinical depression. And then we're going to get into part two. And who knows? We might have part three, part four, part five. We don't know. Because depression can be that. This could just never end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some of the rest of our podcast. <laughs> it's just depression. Um, all right, guys. So we'll see you at the next, uh, next uh, episode. Thanks for listening. Bye. Hey, everyone. Victoria here. Thanks for listening to Studio Talk. We hope you enjoyed our conversation into all things related to mental health. As always, you can head over to Studio Talk on YouTube or on Ziomara's website at the x-studio.org, where you can click on the podcast tab on the top menu. Sign up for our email list is there, as well as check out all the links and resources, including Ziomara's website, in the show notes. That's all for this episode, and we hope to see you next time. If you are experiencing any psychological distress, please call 911 or go to your nearest emergency room.